I think that worked. I think that worked. Let me check the comments, see if people can hear us, because I'm not usually very good at this. Um, are we live? And on both channels as well. So welcome to Bob the Science Guy's channel. How are you doing, Bob? Welcome to Conspiracy Cats channel. <laughs> How's uh, Baldy Cats today? Baldy Cats. It's uh, oh, Baldy Cats today. Yeah. Your alternate personality. I got you. I've not even got a notification for my own live video. How about that? There we go. Live now. Uh, good. Well, let me turn that down. Looks like it is working. Um, we've not done a stream before. No, we haven't. We haven't. Oh. We should have done one long ago, but this is long overdue. Yeah, very, very long overdue. Um, I tell you, I mean, obviously, everybody, you, you know, you're over 20,000 subscribers now. So everybody who's been in this community um, who follows me will know who you are. But just just for those who don't, I mean, I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll put the link to your channel in my description so people can watch this video on your channel. But do you want to, you know, I don't think. know, tell people what, you, what, what you've what you been up to since, you know, what you, what well, you do? Well, let's see. I've had a, a channel now on YouTube for, oh, a couple of years. Let me go ahead and try to get to my chat here real quick. I'm going to have to drop that down. Well, I've had a YouTube channel for a couple of years. Um, you know, I kind of got into this community uh, after watching some videos from Sir Sick, um, uh, Wolfie6020, and believe it or not, you. Uh, you were one of my early inspirations on doing this. And I figured if you could do it, I could do it. So that's Absolutely. one of the reasons that I started my channel. So, I get that a lot. Uh, you know, so for the first couple of years, I, I mostly concentrated on doing um, flat earth debunks because it personally amused me. And I was fascinated by the psychology behind people in the 21st century that actually believed the earth was flat and that gravity mm -hmm. didn't exist. I, I thought that was comical. But I got bored of it, to be honest with you. And I kind of started a new channel called Research Flat Moon, uh, kind of a little nod to my old, my old life, where I do mostly science stuff. And it's designed for homeschool science. It's designed, um, you know, to deal with the psychology of conspiracies and uh, even, even some mathematics. I've had Trig on Tuesday for the last few weeks, and it's been pretty popular. But that's basically my story. I'm from northern Michigan here in the United States. I'm an internal medicine physician in my day job. And uh, I've always had an interest in this sort of education and science education. Well, you, you just made me realize I made a massive clangor because uh, I've linked out the doc, uh, Dr. Bob, Bob the Science Guy channel in the description and not the one where this is being simulcast. So I'll see if I can somehow figure that out while you're doing your presentation. Yeah, get it's the Research right Flat link. Moon. Research Flat Moon. If you find that, that's where we are. Uh, I'll update the banner across the bottom so people can see that. Um, right. This this isn't going to be a, a massively long stream. I know we said we're going to keep it relatively short, but there's been a lot of noise in the flat Earth community at the minute, especially on Nathan Oakley's channel, where they try and find lots of things to get wrong deliberately. Uh, they seem to go through a uh, go through a cycle of, of things to get wrong, and now they're on the sextant. They want to talk about the sextant and get that wrong. So <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna present to you two arguments that I've heard from flat Earth recently about sextants. Just to see if I'm correct. Oh. Yeah. Hang just on to half see... a second. Let me just turn off this volume real quick. I just want to see that I'm uh, I'm correct on what the flat earthers think about a sextant. The first one's a bit silly. Uh, in fact, I have no idea what the first first guy's trying to say. Uh, first come across this on Fluff Spectives channel, who's nearly at five thousand subscribers, by the way. So. Feel free to link your channel out in the description, pal, and uh, hopefully we'll get you there in the stream. But anyway, um, this are you familiar with Flatzoid? Oh, I've heard of him once or twice. He's an interesting character. Well, Fla Flatzoid has been talking a lot about the sextants lately, and he told me something about a sextant that I don't know if I knew it or not, because it is that confusing. I don't even know what he's trying to say. So if I play the clip, maybe you could shed some light on this. You ready? Yep. Notice the angle is a right angle. Look at the vertex. This can only happen with straight right angles. So that, that was the first thing. Uh, is he drawing says. the angle on the body of the sextant? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, let's play, let's play that again. Notice the angle is a right angle. Look at the vertex. This can oh only my happen God. with straight right 
angles. And you can only have a vertex with straight right angles. We can't we can't have pointy things on any other shape. Um, Bob, but it's, he's it's not even a right angle, right? It's not. It's sixty degrees. Yeah, it's oh. not even remotely close. So where do we go with that? Like, did he have any validity to what he said there, or should I just ignore that? Uh, no, there's no validity to that whatsoever. All right. That, my friend, is not a right angle. He, he even doubled down on it in the comments section when people told him. He said, no, 60 degrees is a right angle. And then he said it was, some, it was 60 degrees is a right angle because a, 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 an acute angle is below 90 degrees. So, therefore, it's a right acute angle. I, 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 I can't even begin It's a to right it. acute angle? Yeah. I can't Cats, begin. We're going to have to have some ground rules here. You're going to have to stop pulling boners like that or my eyes are going to start to bleed. <laughs> and I do occasionally need them. <laughs> All right. God. It was, the, thank That's you so amazing. Much. <laughs> thank you so much for Tim Tully. Uh, really, really appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. Right. Now, how do I take, how do I take that off now? Okay, right. The next one is a more serious point. I've heard um, I've heard a few flat earthers say this, okay? So I'll play you the next thing he said, um, and then I'll tell you what I think the problem is, and you can, because I know you've used one, you understand these things, right, and you can, you can tell, I'll, I'll allow you to do your presentation, you can tell me how close they are. So this is, this okay. is the end of his video. Here we go. It's very simple. To get the trigonometry to work, the horizontal has to be a zero degree, aka a flat plane. Thank you very much for watching. It's very simple. To get the trigonometry to work, the horizontal has to be a zero degree, aka a flat plane. Thank you very much for watching. So important, he had to say it twice. Um, now, what I think he's saying, right, for the for the for the benefit of anybody out there. Uh, who might need some of that translating. <clears throat> you, you tell me where I'm going wrong here in what I think he's saying, and then you can, t you know, I'll put you on screen, you can do your presentation, and I'll look out in the chat for anyone who's got questions for you. Got it. Monitor my channel too. I'll have mine up a little bit, but... Um... Yes, I'll, if I, if, in fact, if I have your channel on my phone, okay. uh, then if people tag me in and Baldy Cats on your channel, uh, I'll get the cats in a minute. Yep. I'll be able to see it on both. Right, what, what I think they're saying is this, right? We've got a yep. star in the sky, or a luminary, a, cel a celestial a body in the sky. It's a star, or it's a, a planet. A, yeah. A, and, you know, they're stood on the ground over here with a sextant, and they're measuring this angle. And, you know, they're imagining, you know, that they've got this right angle triangle here, and they're thinking that a right angle triangle, um, you know, if there was curve on the Earth, this bottom bit wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't form perfect right angle triangle. So therefore, anything we ever do with a sextant ever is completely invalid. Okay. Is, am I right? is that what they're basically saying? Yep. Okay. And that's based on a basic misunderstanding of geometry. Do you know, fact, do you know what that, you familiar with what I'm talking about? I, I think I think I am, but I'm, I'm going to let you present this. Um, you tell me. I know you need to go full screen at some point. Um, tell me when you need to go full screen. Uh, but I'm just going to get the link up so I can monitor your channel comments. Well, anytime you're ready, man. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get that up now. So I'm going to pass it right. to Bob. If, if you've got questions to Bob about, because uh, I think it's important we get that information out there about how these sections actually work. It's going to be interesting for me because I've never been hands on and actually uh, used one. So this will, this will be interesting. Um, and it'll be something for the flat earthers to completely ignore, not to watch, and then post on our on our respective channels and call us liars about, which is, I think we know that's going to happen. Cats, we don't do this for the flat earthers. They're too far gone. Uh, they, Their entire uh, sense of self worth is based on a narrative that they have. All right. Yeah. They, they don't listen to any of these, and as you heard from Ranty the other day, they don't watch any of these debunks. So, who are we doing this for? We're doing this for the people that are watching it, all right? We're not going to convince the flat earthers. We have people that maybe are interested in this sort of stuff, and they'll watch it to learn. Uh, there are mm. people that have some questions about, you know, they've had some idiot in their family, you know, the uncle, the uncle that we all have. 
come on out and say the earth's flat and vaccines, you know, change your DNA. Well, they're looking for information from people like us to be able to counter those sorts of arguments because, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you and I have known each other for a while. I think that you would agree I'm a relatively bright individual and have quite a bit of training in the sciences. Uh, Absolutely. I was hard pressed when I first got into this community to say specifically how I would prove that it was the earth rotating and not the sky. I had to actually think about that. You know? And you're right. I mean, people do. One of the things, and so I just want to thank Alan for that. This sounds good. Thank you so much uh, um, for that, Alan. Really appreciate it. One of the things that the, the few things that the flat earthers are right about is that a lot of people don't really study the science around the shape of the earth or anything like that until until you get into this argument and then it's very easy to find and that's the thing that's frustrating it's so easy to find out but of course when when you are new to everything and somebody says to you you know if you certainly if you've not got background in science the Rayleigh criterion is the reason things disappear bottom up unless you actually know what the Rayleigh criterion is and you, you you're quite numerate and you you've got experience with with uh, diffraction and and whatnot it's going to be very difficult for you to understand and rebuke that argument, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, so, so you're right. So it is an educational thing. I certainly, uh, you know, I certainly agree with you on that. But I also think that there are people out there who are kind of maybe being led astray by some flat earthers who are kind of on the rabbit hole, at the edge of the rabbit hole. And hopefully when they watch, they can compare how articulate you're going to explain this and just how well they work and disprove the flat earth to the flat earthers argument. That we've just seen, you know, and and, and kind of realize they're being a bit silly. Um, well, I don't know how articulate I'll be, but you know, we have a saying here in the states, and that is even a blind squirrel gets a nut sometimes. So <laughs> maybe I'll have a good day today. Well, I'm going to duck out the stream now. I'm going to put you on. I will monitor the chat, and it's all yours. Very well. Okie dokie. I go. All right, guys, in my chat, go ahead and address your claims to Baldy Cats you know, at Baldy Cats, and uh, if you want to get a hold of me, because I'm probably going to be paying attention back here, because, of course, I'm in the running for best use of whiteboard. Remember to vote for me when the, when the, when the competition comes up. All right, well, we got a couple of problems with the flat earth. First of all, they don't understand basic geometry. Now, let me just show you something here, cats. All right, if we have a curve right here, do you agree and understand that we can draw one line that is tangent to that curve at one point? And yeah. if we can draw one line that's tangent to the curve, we can draw a line that's perpendicular to it as well. So the first problem that they have is they don't understand that you can draw a tangent line and have something perpendicular to a curve. So that just kind of destroys their argument to begin with. Ah, uh, what I do? The other yeah, thing so that I want to kind of go I, over. I'm muted when I'm off stream. So if you do ask me a question, I can't answer. Sorry. I didn't know whether you wanted me to answer that or not. So just pretend. Yeah, I'm but you now. understand what I'm talking about now, though. But you can't oh, have a tangent line and a line that's perpendicular to a curve. Another problem that they have is lots of times they talk about these circles, the plane of a circle which is um, a circle of equal altitude. You'll hear uh, some of the, the flurfs talk about that. The easiest way to do that is if you have a funnel and turn it upside down, set it on a book, the rim of the funnel forms a circle. However, if you take a globe, you can actually put the funnel right on the surface of the globe too, and it'll fit very nicely. So simply because there's a circle that's an area of equal altitude doesn't by any means mean that it has a flat plane. It can be done on a sphere as well. But here's the other mathematic principle that I really want to go over. And that is if you have two parallel lines like that, and you draw another line between them, I got some shine right there. There we go. You understand that they're similar angles. So this angle right here is exactly the same as that angle right there. That's kind of basic geometry that we learned, but you know, sometimes it's nice to just look at it. And the other interesting thing is that if you have two parallel lines and you draw a line perpendicular to both of them, so you have right angles, well, still those angles are also right angles, right? They're the same. So let's go ahead and look at how a sextant works. Now, 
for those of you that are interested, this is a Davis Mark 25 sextant, and this is certified for use in navigation, in marine navigation. And it's got a couple of different parts to it. Uh, the first part is that it's got a little telescope on it. And what you do is you look through this telescope, through this partial mirror right here, and you look out at the horizon. Now, when you have this set to zero degrees, zero minutes, you can also look at the horizon through this mirror up here. And it's set at an angle and it bounces down to this mirror and back to the telescope. So whatever this mirror sees, this mirror also sees, all right? And it's kind of like a periscope like this. Well, here. So we've got a mirror up here, and we've got a mirror down here, and then we have a little telescope. And what happens is we can look through this telescope out at an object here, and we can also look at that same object and have it come down, bounce, and go through here, and it'll appear at the same spot. That's the way a sextant works. Now, when it's set for zero, zero, here is your object mirror, and here is your horizon mirror. Now, if it's set for zero, zero, they're both looking at the same location. However, say you have a star up in the sky. By simply moving this index arm, you can bring light from that star down, project it to this mirror, and then back to the eyepiece. And the way that you take a reading on a sextant is you look through the telescope and you'll see the horizon, okay? And then what you do is you look at the sun, for example, and you bring the sun down until it just touches the horizon. And you actually swing the sextant back and forth a little bit, like a pendulum, to make sure that that sun touches the horizon at the lowest swing of the pendulum. And what that tells us is basically, So you see, we've got an angle here, and it tells us that angle. Now, say you're on the Earth, and this is the equator of the Earth, this purple line. And right out here, this red dot, it's going to be the sun. Now, obviously, this would be what we call the equinox. So... This angle right here corresponds to your latitude. So if we're up here, we can form a radius from the center of the Earth straight out through us, and this angle will be the same thing as our latitude. That's what a sextant is designed to do. Now, how does it do that? Well, when we're standing here, we have a line that is a vertical, that is our horizontal, and that goes up to our zenith, straight over our head. At a right angle to that is our horizontal line. All right? So that's the right angle that they're talking about right there. Now, next, what the sextant does is it allows you to get an angle to the sun. Now, here's a problem that the flat Earth runs into. If the sun's over here above the horizon, what is the angle that we have to look to see the sun? And this is where a flat Earth does not work with a sextant. A lot of people would think that we'd have to look down this way at the sun. However, the sun's so far away and its rays arrive in parallel, we don't look that way. We look that way. And it's the exact same angle as there. 
So let's go ahead and look at something real quick. Remember down here when I said that if we had two parallel lines and we had a, a perpendicular line drawn through them so that they were right angles, that these two angles would be the same. So this is our horizontal line, this purple line. And it's parallel to this purple line right here. So we are going to measure this angle with our sextant. And that angle is right there. Everybody see why those two angles are exactly the same? By the way, that's angled up a little bit. These two lines are also parallel. So that angle is that angle. However, if we subtract that angle from 90, we get this angle right here. That angle is that angle. And that is what's called the zenith angle, and that's the basic operation of how a sextant works. By measuring this angle and subtracting it from 90, we get that angle, which is exactly the same as that angle, which is our latitude. Now, I've done a few of these things. Uh, I did them down when I was on vacation in Florida because I had a nice view over the ocean to the south, and I was able to get a number of beautiful noon sights on the sun. And I was able to get my latitude within about 10 miles, which is not bad considering it was the first three times I had ever used a sextant in my life. Now, here in Michigan, the only place that I have a nice southern view over water is at the very top of Lake Michigan, and I'm only there about once a month, and it's never at noon. So there's another way that you can do it, and that is to use a reflected surface called an artificial horizon. I'll be happy to explain uh, how that works if you would like me to. But basically, you look at the reflected light of the sun and compare it to the direct angle of the sun. Divide that angle in half because you're measuring twice your angle, and that is your latitude. And I was able to do that in 1.8 nautical miles on my last try, about 10,000 feet. And considering I was able to get it within 1.8 nautical miles on my last try and the circumference of the earth is, you know, 24,900 miles, I think that that's probably good enough. And when it comes to sextants, if you can see the island, that's close enough. You know, uh, with that, I was actually within cannon range. So that's basically how a sextant works, Cat. Um, let's go ahead and see if we've got any questions from anybody. Right, I'll have to bring myself back in for that. We have uh, we have had one. And apologies, I'm, I'm getting used to the new streaming software. So somebody has asked a couple of times, and I can't remember your name, so I apologize. Um, does this mean that sextants can only be used during the day? No, absolutely not. Uh, I was up in Marquette last, uh, I was up in Marquette Let's see, I think it was last weekend. And just for laughs, I actually went out and I shot the North Star. Now, there's a certain time that you can use the sextant at night, and that's during something called nautical twilight. Nautical twilight is the time right after sunset or just before sunset when there's enough light out there. You know, the, uh, the actual definition is you have to be able to see a ship from a quarter of a mile away. But the bottom line is there's enough light out to see the horizon but it's dark enough that you can still see some stars. And there are 56 navigation stars that you use. And believe it or not, the North Star is not one of them. And they're very bright stars and you should be able to see them, you know, in this very low light condition where you have just enough to see the horizon or, and you can also see the stars. Now, the other thing that you can do with that, and I have one of these coming that's due here on Tuesday. And they used to use sextants in air navigation. And in World War II, the United States Army Air Corps used something called an A-12 bubble sextant. So instead of having the horizon, it measured the angle of a star at night against a bubble. 
And I'm looking forward to playing with that a little bit because I want to start doing what they call three star fixes. And I want to see whether or not that that works a little bit. Now, I do have a question that's very good in my chat. And that is, can I explain the, the well, he, he is talking about the dip calculation. But there are a couple of corrections that you have to make. Uh, would you like me to go over those real quick, Katz? Yeah, dip was something I was I wanted to ask you about myself. Um, I know Ranty from perspective was was talking to me about that earlier on. So yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, and I'm just lining up a couple more questions. I will disappear. All right. Give me half a second here to prepare. Well, while you're doing that, it was Doctor Osiris who asked the question. Uh, I, I managed right. to go back and find it. So ah, crap. Um, oh. all, all right. right, so here is the surface of the earth. Now, the way a sextant works is we start off here. Actually, that would be a little bit more over here. And we draw the radius through our position. Okay, so here we are. All right, then what we do is we have to measure from a line perpendicular to that radius. So that's our horizontal line. Now, the other thing that is required to do this is you have to be up to your eyeballs in the water. You have to do this directly from the surface. However, none of us can do that. We're standing on the shore. We're standing on the deck of a ship. We may be, you know, if you're on an aircraft carrier, maybe 200 feet off the water. How do you adjust for that? So we look at our angle. So here's our body out here. Now, normally, we would measure up like that. However, we're standing up here. And now that object's a little higher because it's a parallel ray. So we're measuring that angle to the star or the sun. And we're measuring that angle to the horizon. And that is our vertical. That's the angle that we want. This is what they call the dip angle. And what you do is you go to something called the Naval Almanac. And it will tell you for whatever height you are above the surface of the water, what correction you have to make for your dip angle. So if I'm measuring 60 degrees here, okay, and according to my dip angle, I'm 1.5 degrees is my dip. Well, what I do is I subtract 1.5 and I come up with my actual angle to the star is 58.5 degrees. Now, there are a couple of other corrections that need to be made as well. One of which is, is that a straight line? No, it's a refracted line. The star is actually right there because the atmosphere curves the light coming from the star and makes it appear a little bit higher. How much? One minute, two minutes. All right, a minute is 1 60th of a degree. So if you just measure to the star, you could be as much as two or three miles off. So what you do is you take into account the refracted. You take into account refraction. And the values for refraction are determined by what this angle is. So if it's 90 degrees, if you're on the equator and it's the equinox, your refraction is zero. You know, if you're at 80 degrees north and the sun is way down on the horizon, you're going to have a lot of refraction, a couple of minutes worth. You have to take that into account. The two other, the two other corrections that you have to make, uh, one is the first correction you make, and that's called the index error. And that's a mechanical error with your, with your sextant. So, for example, when you look at a star, if you see two stars with this set on zero, what you have to do is you have to make some adjustments to these mirrors so that you only see the one star. 
if you can't get it or it's very close, but you find that by simply using the micrometer a little bit and you have to dial in, say, five minutes, well, that's fine. You have to just make your measurement and then realize the first thing you have to do is subtract that five minutes or add it, depending on whether it's on or off. And the last correction is this one right here. Some of the audience may have heard, you know, picked up on this already. We want to measure the angle to the center of the sun. But what we measure is the horizon on what's called the bottom limb of the sun. This sun has width generally around 30 or 31 minutes, almost half a degree or a little bit more. So you go to the Naval Almanac and you find out in August of the year, based on where we are in our orbit around the uh, sun, we know the size of the sun and we have to sit down and, and you know, correct it by 16.2 arc minutes. That will bring us from the bottom limb up to the center of the sun. So these are the little corrections that you use. If you don't do that, you're going to be 16 miles off. But if you correct it to the center of the sun, then you're dead on. And like I said, I was able to do this with minimal practice to under two miles. And it's very easy to do. It's surprisingly easy to do. I'm surprised that uh, more flat earthers do not buy a sextant, which is about 200 bucks, and go out and learn how to do this because then they won't be flat earthers anymore. By the way, hashtag send cats money so he can buy a Davis Mark 25 sex, sextant. He needs 200 bucks. So do some don't, super don't, chats to his channel. Don't, don't send me money, but thanks, Bob. Don't, I'll, 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 uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not the strongest swimmer. I won't be going out to sea. Uh, thank you, though. Um, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, thank you, Mr. Egg Cake, for the, uh, for the super sticker. Now, a couple of people have asked, so Tommy Graham won't be in one. Robert Oakley being another. A couple of people have asked about um, longitude and how you. Ah, that's fun. Right. I actually have a whole series coming up on that. Uh, in 1706, they never really had a good way to find longitude. And in 1706, four out of five ships in a British fleet ran aground because they misjudged the longitude and over 2,000 sailors were killed. All right, there, were only one, there was only one or two survivors from the entire fleet. Uh, that irritated the British. And as a result, they came up with something called the Longitude Act and they offered 20,000 pounds for anybody that could find a way to find a longitude within half a degree. And even, you know, if you got it in three quarters, you got 15,000 pounds. If you got it within a full degree, you got 10,000 pounds. But in the early 18th century, you know, 20,000 pounds nowadays is nothing to laugh at. All right. Uh, back then, you could retire and so could your children. And there were two approaches for it. One was an astronomy-based approach. And the two main ways that they did that was one, they looked at the eclipse of Jupiter's moon Io, which is the one that's closest to Jupiter. That goes around a thousand times a year. And they knew precisely what time in Greenwich that moon would slip behind Jupiter. And they knew precisely the second that it would come out the other side. And they published that in the Naval Almanac. So if you're out in Tahiti or in Nanchez, Mississippi, and you want to find out what your longitude is, you set up a telescope and you watch Io. And the instant it goes behind Jupiter, you say mark, and you mark the time. And you compare that to your local solar noon. And by taking the amount of time after noon, you could figure out how, how, it, how far you were from Greenwich. Now, to give you an example, Greenwich, England is the prime meridian. All right. Why Greenwich? Look up the British Navy. All right. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, guys. It's the British Navy. Uh, the other thing is the main rival at the time was France. 
And quite frankly, Paris is pretty doggone close to the prime meridian. It's only two degrees off. So it kind of made the French a little happy too. So they could, they could live with that. Uh, interesting story about that, by the way. Uh, so what they do is that's zero. So when it's 12 noon at Greenwich, all right, if you go 15 degrees west, what time is it? It's going to be 11 o'clock. If you go another 15 degrees, it'll be 10 o'clock. All right. Now, my solar time here is, let's see. Five, you know, if you look at my solar time right here, I'm five hours and 40 minutes behind Greenwich. Now, five hours would be 75. It's 15 degrees per hour. You work that out. I'm at 85 degrees west longitude. Now, the other thing that you can do, if we have tables that publish exactly, you know, one of the ways that we we calculate latitude is we need to know the declination of the sun. The sun's not always right over the equator. Sometimes, like right now, it's about 14 degrees above the equator. It's coming back down from the, um, the summer solstice at 20, 23 and a half degrees. And it's worked its way down to about 14. And at the equinox in September, it'll cross the equator and start going south. So we know precisely where the sun is at any time. Bob, can I just ask you a question? Not not everybody watching will know um, what declination and right ascension are. Could you just run over those? For, yeah. For us? All right. Well, two things. All right. Latitude are these lines. They're parallel to the equator. Longitude is the line that goes between the poles. Zero degrees longitude goes through Greenwich, well, up here, goes through Greenwich, England, which is just outside of London, as I recall. It's where the Greenwich Observatory, the Royal Observatory is. That was designated as zero latitude, or zero longitude. As the Earth rotates from west to east, it rotates at 15 degrees per hour. Cats? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm muted on off screen, go It rotates at 15 degrees per hour. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry, I was responding to someone in the chat. What, 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 what? Bob. Oh, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Right. Bob. I was sorry. giving you the honor, man. It's your show. Oh, it's dear, 15 degrees per hour. So every hour, the Earth rotates that way 15 degrees. So if it's noon here, an hour later, it's noon here. An hour later, it's noon here. That's called right ascension, and that goes around 24 hours. Okay? So, when solar noon, solar noon at your position is when the sun is highest in the sky and directly due south of you. Now, you compare solar noon here to solar noon in Greenwich, you divide that by 15 degrees, and that gives you, or you divide, you know, you multiply the number of hours and minutes by 15 degrees per hour, and that tells you your longitude. All right. The other way that you can do it is, you know, sometimes, you know, we talked about the sun being out here over the equinox. Well, the Earth's axis is tilted, so sometimes it's as high as 23 and a half. Sometimes it's as low as 23 and a half. And these, that's the Tropic of Capricorn, that's the Tropic of Cancer. So you have to know what this angle is, because if you're sitting right here, your sextant is going to read that angle, and you have to add to it the angle of declination to find your latitude, all right? But the bottom line is, you always know the sun's somewhere, and it's, say it's right here. If at, at solar noon, that sun is directly below you. It's directly south of you, which means that the longitude of the sun here is your longitude. Longitude's a lot more complicated than latitude is. Latitude's a simple angle. Longitude is time. And there are a couple of ways of doing it. You know, in addition to the, uh, in addition to Io, they also looked at the angle between the sun and the moon. 
And the way you check that angle is instead of holding the sextant like that, you hold it like that. And you, you put the sun and the moon together. You can actually calculate your, latitude, your longitude from that, but it is a boatload of math. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to come up with a clock that was accurate to within three seconds a day to win the prize. And they worked, you know, a guy named, I believe his name was Williams, John Williams or Will Williamson. He worked on that for 40 years and finally won the prize. And that became the uh, type four chronometer, ship's chronometer. And once you could actually get time, you could tell what your latitude was. It used to be, you'd, you know, go to a certain line of longitude and kind of sail in the direction where you're going to go until you, you hit something, you know. Sorry, my uh, my camera uh, spazzes out on 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 rare on regular intervals. I normally just edit them out, but this is live, so we don't get to do that. Oh, it's going to like the the, uh, the fun and games of live TV. I'm just going to give a couple of thanks, and then I have uh, another question for you. Unless you've got more to explain on that. No, go right ahead. Right, I'll just give that, and then um, then I'll put another couple of questions to you. Just uh, Storm on a uh, John Rap and Tati Bogle, Thank you so much for the. Uh, Super stickers, snark, a little piece of the sextant. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, John Rapp, yep, that button did work. Um, I think all caught up. Okay, uh, the Rumpus has, has messaged a couple of times, and I know you said this, but... Rumpus? Who's he? The Rumpus. There's a Rumpus? There's a, there is a Rumpus, the infamous <laughs> Rumpus. Have you got <laughs> Every, yeah, everybody check the check the room side. We don't know who's a, a legend. This is a, Rumpus is an old buddy of mine. He always tells me how I'm wrong. Oh. So how am I wrong now, Rumpus? You, no, no, no. He's uh, he's not saying you're wrong at all now. Um, he just wanted to emphasize a point that you made. Um, that I'd just like you to expand on a little bit for those that didn't uh, pick it up. That when you are using the horizon, you are using the horizon as a means to find horizontal. You're not Correct. treating the horizon as, as horizontal. C could you could you just expand on that for a second for the, because I think that's a that's a flat earthers problem that they think we're looking at the horizontal, so therefore we're making a flat right angle triangle. Uh, so we're looking excellent. at the horizon, you know. Yeah. No, that's problem. actually an excellent point. Let me do it again. Um, I'll just All right. put you back on. So here's the curve of the earth. And we're on top of a building. And we've got our sextant up here. And we're going to go ahead and have a look down at the horizon. What direction are we looking? That way, right? Now, from there, we're also looking at a star. And that's up there. So what is the angle that we're measuring on the sextant? It's this angle right here, and that's called HS, angle of the sextant. Now, in case you're curious, when we do all the corrections, then it becomes something called HO, which is the actual corrected angle. But neither here nor there. So. This is the angle, that is the horizontal. This is the angle to the star. This is the dip angle. We go to the nautical almanac and it will tell us for this height, our dip equals 1.5 degrees, okay? So what we do is we take this whole angle that we measure and we subtract the 1.5 degrees and it gives us that vertical angle. That's the dip. Now, there's another way that you can get rid of that dip too and get a true horizontal. I wasn't going to do this, but you forced me into it, cats. Let's say we're sitting out here in Michigan 
and I have no horizon that I can see. But I do have a little pan of water that I can put some old coffee in, just enough to cover the bottom. And that'll give me a level surface because as we all know, coffee always finds its level. Now, if I stand over here, there's a point that I can stand and I can look down into this reflective surface and I can look up and I can see the sun. Okay, so I look down with my sextant at the reflection and I see the reflection of the sun. Then I can look up with my sextant and I see the reflection of the sun there. These lines are parallel. I can measure this angle and if I divide it in half, that angle is the same as that angle. And that is a true horizontal. There awesome. is no dip correction. That's, the, that's called using an artificial horizon. And you literally use a pan with a little coffee in it or I have a black pan and I have a little water in it, as long as you don't shield it from the wind a little bit, that is a level mirror. And by using this geometry, because remember, this angle and that angle are also the same too, because it bounces off at the same angle. Intercepts your sextant. This angle is twice that angle. So you cut it in half, and now you have the true angle to the sun. So you're using the, the famous flat earth level water. To, so they can't argue with that. They can't argue with that. It's not level water. It's level coffee. Level coffee. <laughs> I've just been keeping an eye on your chat because um, I know you've been, you've been talking a lot. Just let you know. Um, Judy just sent Judy. me some money. Thank you, Judy. There Judy you is a great That's patron of our, uh, our channel here. Brilliant. I, you know, I just uh, wanted to point that out. Next, next question, and I think you, you've sort of handled uh, this, but... I think the, the, this is from Fleur's perspective. I think the Flat Earth debate team and Nathan Oakley, et cetera, are saying that when you uh, are, are taken into account dip, it's, uh, it doesn't include Earth curvature. Uh, sure now, my understanding is, yeah, because you're talk, cause it, it's related to, the, to your elevation. To your height. Um, it, to, I'll, I'll put the question up, and then I'll, uh, I'll disappear and let you just reiterate that. I'll just take myself off. So. Bollocks, can't find the question. Uh, but I'll read it out here. Does the dip include earth curvature? If so, is yes, that it does. Nail in the coffin for them? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it absolutely does. And the reason that you can, and where does that dip come from? All right. If you go to Walter Bislin's Advanced Earth Curve Calculator, and you say, well, I'm at Warren Dunes at 180 feet above the level of Lake Michigan. All right. What we always do is, well, how far can we see and how much Chicago should we be able to see? But if you actually look at the numbers down there, you'll see what the dip to the horizon is. And the dip to the horizon is the dip. Okay? It's the same dip that we use with Al Biruni. And is it the geometric horizon or the apparent horizon? It's the apparent horizon. All right? Now, I shaved this morning... And I saw an apparent me in the mirror. Does that mean that I do not exist? I do exist. I have to exist or I wouldn't see an apparent me in the mirror. Same thing with the geometric horizon. The other problem that the flat earth always gets wrong, and it just irritates me, and I'm surprised more people haven't gotten up to it. Well, from a one-foot observation height, the horizon can be no more then 1.22 miles away. No, dumbass. It can be no less than 1.2 miles away. Refraction will make it farther. For example, in the black swan image, how far is the horizon? It's 1.85 miles away. That's because of the refraction. And if you don't think that's right, Brandon 
and I actually determined it based on how much of the black swan is hidden by, by the horizon. It's 1.85 miles away. Not 20, not 10, 1.85. Because 15 to 20 feet of the black swan oil rig is hidden by earth curve. But I hope that answered. So yes, it does include earth curve. It's the dip to the horizon. And I think it's quite telling that, you know, you've come on here, you've been, we've been going, what, 45 minutes. And um, you've explained more about the sextant and how it works and how it's used to find your location and why it's, you, you've, you've, ex, you've explained more than that than the Flat Earth debate team have in the past two or three months when they've been talking about the sextant. You know, what, like it is very questionable why none, none of them will go on and show that they understand it as well as someone like you who's used it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and put something out that I put out to Nathan Oakley the other day. I have no respect for Nathan, and I'm not there to generate views for his silly little channel. But it's my understanding that they requested that somebody that knows something about sextants come on their channel and explain it to them. I have offered to do so. Just like I offered to have Quantum Eraser on my channel for a friendly discussion about my weight differentials by latitude experiment that I did on the way down to Florida. <laughs> he declined. He would not even respond. Nathan Oakley has not responded. That's because they are both cowards. Because they know that I have them and there is nothing that they can say or do that changes it. I have them dead to dead to rights. Absolutely, they, they are they are exactly like that. Flat Zoe um, put a video out the other week of him talking to Quantum Eraser, and Quantum Eraser a couple of minutes in issued me a direct challenge. You know, like come on, cats, if you ever got out your echo chamber, I would destroy you. You know, it was it was as much of a direct challenge as it could be. So I skyped him. I sent him a message on Skype and said, right. I gave him the timestamp of his challenge and said, I'm all up for this. Let's do it. Let's find a, a nice neutral channel. Let's talk. Let's have a good debate. It'd be great. Um, and he told me to piss off. That was his response. Well, let, me, let me just put it this way. You know that's not true, right? That it would be a civil you, debate. No, that you know that that isn't true, that he wouldn't debate you. Because he did once. Because I was there. I heard it. Ah. You were on Anthony Riley's channel. Oh, and that you was Nathan Oakley. Nathan Oakley to tears. Yeah. And you did it in about three minutes. That, that, and uh, Nathan quite Oakley. frankly, you know, I mean, the way I look at it, you know, it's kind of like channels, man. If you can do that, I could probably do that. I'm thinking yeah. I might be able to do that. I think I think you do a much better job than I ever would. Uh, far better. Job. Can you triangle, you, know, you can triangulate with a sextant. A sextant simply measures angles. Let me show you. Now, here is, I, let me see if you can even see this. I'll just put you on, on big screen. All right. Now, I'm kind of looking at the camera, I think. Can you see my eyeball here and up here? Okay, see, it's too dark uh, on screen. Um, I can only see black with, with the glasses. All right. How about against this? Can you see down the barrel of the telescope through here? Yes. Can you see it up here too? Yeah. When you tilted it a little bit, yeah, I did it to start with it. I could see right down the barrel on both of them and then he tilted it away. So yeah, we, we, yeah, we could, we could see it. Now this is set zero degrees, zero minutes. So both of these are looking at the exact same angle. By moving this upward, all right, what I'm doing is I'm changing the angle. So I've got an angle here, and I've got an angle here, okay? Actually, that way and that way. So I can actually measure an angle with this. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the things that they did with the moon and the sun was that they would check the angle between them by holding the sextant sideways. And if you wanted to check between, say, a water, a water tank and a radio tower on shore, and you held the sextant sideways and measured the angle between them, you could triangulate your position 
out in the coastal water there. Does that make any sense? So, I have got another. Are you, do you need more to say on that, or can I fire another question at you? All right, hang on. So oh, here's no, shore, and here is a water tank with a light on top of it, and here's a radio tower with a light on top of it. Well, by taking your sextant and measuring the angle between these two, you know that you're right there. And you can measure that angle with a sextant. You know, you can use things for what they're originally intended to, and you can also use them for other things. Um, that's not what a sextant was specifically designed to do, but it's perfectly capable of doing it. Now, go ahead, and you said you had another question? Yeah, no, well, first of all, that's brilliant, that, absolutely brilliant. Um, something I've noticed a few people in the chat saying, and you you did cover this, but just as like a real sort of highlight, could you give us the top the top uh, reasons why a sextant just cannot work on a flat earth? What, what, what's like the headline? Why does it just not work at all if the earth is flat? Yeah, well, it's easy. A sextant reads that angle from the center of the earth. There's no center of the earth on a flat earth. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, the problem that you run into, and if you really want to get right down to it, the obligation with a flat earth is that if the sun is out here, at 90 degrees, that's the angle to your sun. And you'll be able to calculate that angle and you'll be able to triangulate the distance to the sun. And no matter where you were on the earth, it would come back to the same distance. The sun cannot physically be in two locations at once. That's not the direction to the sun on the real world. It comes in in parallel and that's the direction to the sun. That's the that is the entire concept that celestial navigation is built upon, and that is that the light arrives at Earth in parallel. Is it exactly in par parallel? No. Is it good enough to be in parallel? Yes, especially since you make the correction to put it in the middle of the sun rather than the lower limb. All right. If the, if the celestial object is not so far away that the light has to come in in parallel, you're going to get progressive errors in this as you move away from directly underneath the sun. And those errors will not allow you to determine your position. I can determine my position damn near exactly. And I can verify that that's my position by a number of means. I can look between, I can look at my distance from another known position. I can use pilotage. Uh, the difference between pilotage, you know, it's a form of navigation. Pilotage is basically, well, I see the entrance to the bay here, and I see the entrance to the bay here. I know that I'm between the entrances to the bay, and I need to go that way. You're doing it under direct vision. All right, I'm not calculating what angle I have to go. I'm actually following the channel markers into the bay. That's pilotage. All right, so I can determine my location by pilotage by seeing where the intersection of roads are in relationship to where I'm standing. I can, I can pinpoint my location, and I can compare that to the location I measured with my sextant, and they're the same within relatively close distance. So yes, you will not be able to get an accurate location on the earth unless the sun is distant so that the light rays are coming in together and the surface is curved. Now, if the earth was shaped like a cylinder, you would only be able to accurately measure distances across the curve of the cylinder. You wouldn't be able to measure distances in the opposite direction. All right. The very fact that we can, we can measure distances and angles correctly 
in every direction mandates that the Earth is a sphere. Now, I'm going to show you one other thing, because this is just kind of cool to think about. All right. We're going to say that we're going to get together and we're going to have a pint of lukewarm bitters or whatever you guys drink over there. And we're going to meet at, you know, the, the old two boobed lady pub in, or three boobed lady pub in London. Okay. Now, in order for me to find that, I'm going to kind of head, head on over, and once I get kind of close, I'm going to want to know exactly where I am, because once I know where I am exactly, I'll know where you are. So I'm going to say that I'm at 51 degrees, zero, 51 degrees latitude, north latitude, and zero degrees longitude. Okay? Now, that's going to make me a spot right there. And I'm going to know that there are going to be three stars that I can look up in my Naval Almanac. One is going to be, if I'm standing right here, one's going to be in that direction, one will be in that direction, and one will be over there. Okay? Now, if my position is correct, I know that that's 35 degrees, that's 20 degrees, and that's 52 degrees. You with me so far, cats? Now, yeah, I'm following. If I go to this spot, you know, if I'm if I look up and I look up at this star right here, and I measure it at 19 degrees, each degree is 60 nautical miles. So I'm not here. I'm on some line of position here. 60 miles that way because I'm closer. No, screw that up. We're going to make that 21 degrees because Bob's never wrong. All right. So I'm actually 60 degrees closer to that in that direction along this line of position. That's called a line of position. Now, let's look at this star right here. Now, if I'm at that spot, it's going to tell me that I'm at 35 degrees. Well, let's instead say that I'm at 37 degrees. Well, actually, that means that I'm 30 miles that way along that line of position. Okay? So you see how those two cross right there? And then I do this one right here. And uh, say I'm not at 52 degrees, but I'm at 40 degrees. That means that I'm further away, and I'm somewhere on that line of position. You see how those all come together? That's how a three-point fix works. I'm not here. I'm there. Because that's the only place that I can get all three of those readings against those stars and have them work out. And that's a big problem that the Flat Earth has a lot, too. you got to understand, I've got two more videos after that first one I put out that explains a lot of this. So I'm going through an awful lot of material that I'm taking a lot more time and doing in detail on these separate videos. But it's, It really is compelling, you know, especially, you know, just sort of what you said there, how accurately it all fits. And obviously that could only work on a, on a globe couldn't it be just the flat earth you'd just be all over the place wouldn't you um so for king sleepy has, has super chatted both of us um to say uh thank I you for being entertained and i think you've got another one as well yeah i've got one here from i've never seen such behavior in the war room before and it's two dollars for thanks bob is that for the 15 hour uh, or 15 degree per hour drifter because I just showed everybody how to do a three star fix. Uh, now, the reason that I got this other sextant is because it's a bubble sextant. I can set it up on a camera tripod and I want to do some three star fixes because I don't need a horizon for that. All I, I can do that 
during the dark when I can see the stars really well and I can really zero in on those stars and that's the way you do it. So just to kind of give you the idea, say you think that your um, flagpole is 30 feet high and you're standing out on the road somewhere, you think that you're here and you measure that out and that's 20 feet. And say, you know, let, let's make it a 30. So say that would be a 45 degree angle, right? Well, what if you measure it and it's 46 degrees? You're actually over here. If it's 42 degrees, you're really over here. Because if you look up at the top of something, if you move closer to it, the angle gets bigger. And if you move away from it, the angle gets smaller. That's basic perspective. And that's the way a three-star fix works. And what you do is you go on out and before you, that's fine. I appreciate the, I appreciate the kind words. But what you do is, you know, in the afternoon, when you get ready to do your evening site, you say, well, my dead reckoning position is going to be here or here. That's where we think we're going to be based on sailing time and direction. So let's figure out where those stars would be. And you pick six of them and you want them around you. The reason that you pick six is you're counting on at least three of them being obscured by clouds or you can't get a good sight on them for some reason. You know, you want to pick out six and you do all this math for all six stars and you figure out, well, if I can see this star, that's where it should be. If I can see that star, that's where it should be. If I can see the star back there, that's where it should be. And then you measure what it actually is and you figure out where you really are. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. You're, you're right. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Stoll, when can you see stars in Michigan? <clears throat> Yeah, we're basically the uh, we're basically the United Kingdom of the Midwest here, but uh, we do actually get some pretty nice stars once in a while. And I had some really good views of the moon the other day. I looked at twenty different seas and picked out all the Apollo landing sites. It was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that uh, that sort of visual pollution sucks, doesn't it? And light pollution, it's. Um horrendous light for, for we, we have class four skies here and you know when the god when the astronomy gods are with us and there's no and the clouds are gone we get really nice views here and when i'm up in the upper peninsula i got class two skies up there you know you amazed what you could do with some binoculars up there you know mm -hmm. well i mean modern binoculars now you compare them to the the things people like uh, galileo used and uh, you know they're far better aren't they you know, yeah, they compare very favorably and the optics are better. Mm -hmm. You know, my astronomy binoculars are 25 power and 100 millimeter aperture crew serve binoculars. They're that big. You know, they weigh like 10 pounds. They have to be put on a, on a mount. But yeah. I can clearly see all of the moons of Jupiter with them. Mm -hmm. And I can see the rings of Saturn and I can see amazing detail on the moon. It's incredible, isn't it? If only, if only the flat earthers would... Look. Oh, join an astronomy club yeah just go on look you know the ones that say oh the moon isn't real you know it's a it's not a solid object you know if they actually were to look at it just with their own eyes through a quality pair of binoculars or, or a telescope and see all the craters it's just there's, there's no way well, you know the thing really about is. it is is the other day well a couple months ago actually i was on brandon toys channel back when i would go on these channels and they were having a discord and for some reason, I was allowed to share my screen. So while they're all talking about all, you know, how space is fake, I'm actually live streaming geosynchronous satellites to them <laughs> in real time. Brilliant. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, if I can find something the size of a VW bug 40,000 kilometers away, it's not because I'm really good. It's I know exactly where to look for it because I know what the orbit is and I can say it's that way. And, you know, I put it on and there it is in the middle of the damn screen. Yeah. It's amazing. What I've done, um, because I did forget, well, I put the wrong link in the description. Anyone in the chat now who's been listening to Bob, I think there's 240 of us here. Um, I have pinned Bob's version of this stream to the top of this chat. You know, uh, I, I'd urge anyone to click on that, go and watch the rest of it on Bob's channel. 
you know, and hit that subscribe button over there uh, because you've seen the kind of stuff he's capable of doing. I'm sure he's going to get a lot more technical stuff out on there. So I'm hoping to see my view account just plummet now. Uh, as, as everyone goes yeah, everybody, there. everybody from Cat's channel, come on over and see me. Uh, I would really appreciate that. You know, I, I built up 21,000 viewers debunking the flat earth. And then I go on out and I do actual science like this and, and talk about medical topics and all sorts of really cool stuff. I got 2,000 viewers on this new channel. You know, where are they, man? If there are people that are interested <laughs> yeah. in this, please come on over and have a look. You know, it's not that I make a lot of money on it or need it. It's just that I, I put an awful lot of work into these things, putting out videos every day of the week. I just like to see that people appreciate them and, and, it's, and it's worth my time, you know? Well, so. I'm just wondering whether, whether I should end the stream on my channel and then we finish it off on yours. But uh, if I do that, because you're capturing this, I think I might end it on both. Yeah, well, do, we have anything on else? do we have some other things that you wanted to talk about or we pretty well covered it? Do we have another, no. other questions from the chat? Well, yeah, should we, should we end on questions from the chat? Um, and we'll do 10 minutes of that and, and call it a day. And hopefully, yeah, yeah, I can see my my viewers going down now and yours going up. So click on that link at the top. You're going to see exactly the same stuff. He's screen capturing the same stuff, but maybe give Bob a, a subscribe. Um, but what you were saying a minute ago, I, I find with the Agree to Disagree channel, we've had some debates on there because it's not a flat earth debating channel. I don't know if, you're if, you, if you know that... Um, it was a channel that me and Creek used to have together. He's moved on to other things, and I, I have it now with Crafty Keel, and we hold debates uh, on there. Not, not regular, but when they pop up. And we've debated gun control, the death penalty, transgender in sports. Um, is the, We had a black woman on who was wanting to debate that black people are genetically more prone to being violent than other people against an ex-white supremacist who was saying that was a racist viewpoint. You know, really, we've had the Westboro Baptist, I don't know what I was thinking there, but we've had them on to talk about their beliefs. In debate. We've had all sorts. But whenever we do something that's flat earth, miles more views, you know, and it's crazy, isn't it? That like well, Cats, I've got quite a few different things that, you know, we haven't talked a whole lot, but I've got a rather varied background. And there are quite a few things that um, we could probably have a decent chat about. So... I I'd love to get you on to agree to disagree. I just, sorry, can I just, this is way too much. Thank you so much, but that is way, 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 way too much. You got 20,000 pounds? Uh, no, I've got, uh, almost. No, no, that is, that is way too much. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um You got to remember, right. I got old guy eyes. I got old guy eyes. Presbyopia uh, sucks. Oh. I only know what it is, I can spell it. So, uh, well, God, I wish I could. Um, but no, we'd love to have you on, agree to disagree and, and, and talk about all sorts of stuff. But you're right. It's, it's, it's like Flat Earth is it's grown into an end. And I'm, I'm sure I'm responsible and played my part in it and still do, I suppose. Maybe I'm being hypocritical, but it has grown into quite an entertainment. And then when I think, oh, this is way more interesting, you know, let's have this debate on, uh, you know, should, should uh, men who've transitioned to women be allowed to compete in the Olympics? You know, let's have a meet. You, you get maybe three or four hundred people watching, not at one time, but over the entire length of the video. You know, it's like one percent of what you'd normally get. You think, oh, that's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Um, I think you've got some messages there, actually, Bob, on yours. I'm trying to figure out if this is the person I think it is, but there's a couple of good questions out here. First of all, <clears throat> now... Can you talk about directions? Well, yeah, I mean, directions are directions. Now, so if you're right here and you know that that is north, that's zero degrees or it's 360 degrees. That's 90. That's 180, and that's 270. Now, it doesn't matter what direction that you're pointing. If you're looking that way, that's still 90 degrees, all right? 
It's just that if that's 45, you know, there's 45 degrees there, there's 45 degrees there, that's 45 degrees. You know, I, I, I don't really know exactly what they mean. Okay, so, so looking at your example, uh, 51 north, 0 east again, and looking at a compass, then turn 90 degrees left, you would look due west. Yes, if you started looking due north and you turn 90 degrees to the left, you'd be looking due west. Yes, you'd be basically starting here, turning left and looking that way. Oh, what else we got here? I hope that answered your question. Now, the other question is a really good one. And that is, how can the BBC be heard in Australia? Uh, well... We're going to need to actually have somebody that's a radio guy. And I'm not a radio guy. I'd like to be a radio guy someday. Uh, as a matter of fact, somebody gave me a radio telescope. And I've got to sit down and learn how to play with that a little bit. But I'm not the radio guy. I know that you can bounce signals off the moon. That's called an EME bounce. I know that you can bounce signals off the ionosphere depending on weather conditions and you can get some ungodly range. And I also know that there's such a thing as repeaters, which means you send it, you send it to Sydney by cable and then it's broadcast locally to Australia from Sydney. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, but I'm not the radio guy. Um, go to the Aussie perspective. Those are radio guys. All right. Hmm. Yeah, I keep now, being I do, told. Uh, I do know what Knickerbock, what was it, Knickerbock? I do know about, I do know about radio navigation. All right. And I do know how the Germans managed to find London. Uh, and I know how the British managed to fool them to think London was 15 degrees east of where it was. So... So a lot of, there's a lot of pastures that got blown up because some guy figured out how they were figuring out where London was and, and, and outsmarted them. <clears throat> Am I frozen on the screen? I'm frozen on, no, on one screen, but not the other. Uh, I'm The one I'm looking at right in front of me, I, I am, but I'm not on the OBS uh, looking. No, you're fine. Uh, cool, cool. Um, right, whenever it freezes my face, it always freezes it and... Uh, really stupid well I've, I've got a stupid face let's face it so it's always whatever it throws on it's going to look stupid but it always makes it look as, as you know even more stupid Bob, i just want to say thank you so much for coming on um myself and fluff Spective, who is almost at five thousand subscribers is in the chat i'm sure he can link his channel out he's, he's got a wrench you know see if you can help him get there um we've been talking about the sextants on and off for a little while to have you come on and give that thoroughly detailed chat and answer all those questions I feel like I know a lot more about them now, and uh, I just hope that um, anyone who is on the edge, who's kind of teetering away in the channel and looking at it because of what they've been hearing on, you know, the flat debates, might realise now the quality of your information, as opposed to, oh, how can you, you know, if if the Earth is curved, how can you make a flat triangle? You know, it's just you, you, what well, you said is brilliant. Well, two things. I really know. I do know what I'm talking about when I talk about something. And if I don't know what I'm talking about, like the radios, I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, there's an old, there's an old saying, there's always somebody smarter than you. And I don't have a problem sending, sending folks to get questions answered that I don't know to somebody smarter than me. Um, that <laughs> specialist is a guy from out of town. That's the other thing that I learned. But um, there is a no. very good question out here, and that's Loran and E. Loran. Uh, Loran is behind is before my time. Uh, have you ever heard of Loran cats? I know what it is, but have you ever heard of it? Uh, just say that again. Sorry. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Loran. Loran. No. Loran for navigation. No, no, no. All right. Yeah. It's, I mean, cats and I, cats and I are not kids. I'm older than he is, but, uh, Loran is before my time. Loran was used. Um, they stopped using that in the they stopped using that when gps came out because gps was just so much better um 
just amazingly bigger or amazingly better. Loran was, what you would do is you would take a signal and broadcast it from a known location. And then you would, and it would be broadcast based on a time signal. And it would broadcast the time signal. And what would happen was your ship would receive that signal. So you've got the station here. And then you had a signal. That looks wrong, just so wrong. Hang on. Okay, so you've got a station there, and it'll broadcast a signal out like that. And then what you do is you go to a different station, say one here. I was worried when I stood up there for a second, I was trying to remember if I was wearing pants. <laughs> Sometimes I forget too. Yeah. All right, so. Okay, so here's our second signal from this station. So that means that we are either here or we are here. Those are the only two places that we can be. Now, if this is Hudson Bay, This is the Bahamas, and it's 80 degrees, and and we're you know we're swimming. I'm thinking that that's probably a little better bet than that one is, but the way you find out for sure is you listen to another signal, and that and that's where you are, and that's the that's the idea behind Loran. The problem is it's kind of difficult to get a Loran signal when you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean because you're well out of radio range. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you may have some trouble. You can get radio signals out there. But there's a thing like on a VOR, which is a, an air navigation radio beacon, kind of like a radio lighthouse. They have something called a volume of distribution, and that volume of distribution depends on how high you are above the ground. So, for example, if you're 10,000 feet, you may be able to reliably get this VOR from 20 miles. But if you're at 40,000 feet, you may be able to get it at 110. And why is that? Curve of the Earth. All right, what else we got? Anything else in here? Uh, Australian shy for me for questions but i um don't want to go too long on a on a live stream because i think what you've done is so nice and concise i don't if, if the stream's too long i don't want people then sort of not watching it you know what i mean uh because right. oh, it's a nice long stream but i think we've done some uh we nice nice and concise so it's been really useful i'm just checking for any more questions yeah, Pete Johnson's got an interesting one here, and that is the directions are not some other guy's opinion. Directions are based on known points. Absolutely. Exactly. You know, yeah. uh, you know, it's which direction is east is not subject to your opinion nor your approval. It's either east or it's not east. All right. Definitely. Definitely. Well, that's, that's been really, really useful for me. Really, really useful. I'm going to try and end the stream on my end, but stay talking to you, um, and then you can you can keep going on your channel. Those people that, that want to carry on, if you click on Bob's uh, link, which I've pinned to the top of the live chat in mine, but I'm going to hit end stream here now, and hopefully the stream continues at Bob's end. Bob, if it doesn't, I apologize. Well, we'll see because I'm not looking at your stream. I'm looking, I'm in the meeting with you. Yeah, so the, I'm just wondering because I've never used Melon before for this. So I, I don't think the meeting will end, but I'm going to hit end stream now. Um, All right. We, we shall see. I'll hit it on OBS. Uh, 